is drafting a buy. Today I'm going to be analyzing its financials, market risks, and in the end I'm going to give you seven things to keep an eye on to see if the stock is a buy. Katie Wood definitely likes the stock since R is the second biggest shareholder. So there must be something interesting about this business. Let's get straight into it. We're gonna start with a short company overview. DraftKings is a daily fantasy sports and sports betting company. It launched in 2012 with its daily fantasy sports product and later on in 2018, it started offering online sports betting. DraftKings activates as its online sports betting operator in 17 US states and moreover, it activates as a iGaming platform meaning an online casino in five US states. Let me define some industry terms. We have the GGR, which is the gross gaming revenue, which translates into bets minus winnings. The gross gaming revenue is actually the revenue for DraftKings. Secondly, we have the product overview. So we established that DraftKings started with its daily fantasy sports. This is the DFS. It offers peer-to-peer -peer play, whereby users compete against each other for prize money. The DFS product is available in 44 US states. Since DFS was the first product for DraftKings, it represents a big chunk of the company. Next up, we have the online sports betting or the OSB, where users place a bet by wagering money on a sports event. This seems to be the second most important product for DraftKings, but it's going much faster than the DFS. So it looks like in the future, the online sport betting will be the next cash cow for the company. Next, we have the iGaming, which is an online casino, and it offers the full suite of games available in land-based casinos. Lastly, we have the DraftKings Marketplace, which is a non-fungible token that is designed for mainstream accessibility that offers initial NFT drops. And it was launched in August 2021 as a way of engaging more customers. Next, I'm going to be focusing on the business model. More precisely, how does the business make money? For DFS, DraftKings generates revenue from contest entry fees from users, net of prices and customer incentives. For the uh, online sports betting and the iGaming segment, revenue is generated from users' bets, net of payouts made on users' winnings, and incentives awarded to users. Next, we're going to be talking about vertically integrated companies. The games and the sports betting offerings are usually provided by a vendor. The way in which the operator uh, pays for this service is by a revenue share model. However, now DraftKings wants to uh, create everything in-house in order to have more flexibility and better margins. It started doing so with the iGaming segment. As you can see in this photo, uh, around 60% of the total bets from the iGaming sector came in DraftKings homegrown games in 2021. The same thing applies for sports betting, where DraftKings recently acquired a, uh, a sports book platform called SB Tech for around $3.3 billion and it already integrated in its business. This deal marked a shift from a third party supplier to DraftKings have its own tech stack and uh, it offers more safety and flexibility for DraftKings as well as more opportunities for innovation. Next, I'm gonna be talking about KPIs. This is a very important section for DraftKings and I'm gonna start with the MVPs, the monthly unique players. So this is the average number of unique paid players that participated in a real money engagement of the DraftKings products. Another KPI that goes hand in hand with the monthly unique players is the average revenue per monthly unique player. As you can see in this photo, the monthly users grew nicely at the end of 2021, with DraftKings now having almost 2 million paying users. Moreover, we can see that the uh, average revenue per unique player grew modestly, only 18% year over year at the end of 2021. The growth uh, slowed down in uh, 2021. Next up, we have the customer acquisition cost. This is a metric that shows how well the budget for sales and marketing is spent. The formula that I've used for customer acquisition cost is uh, for expenses in the previous period divided by the number of new customers in the current period. We have a comparison side by side for the customer acquisition cost uh, as opposed to the average revenue per user and uh, the customer acquisition cost has grown significantly in the third and the fourth quarter year over year with more than 300% and 44% uh, in the end of 2021. Uh, although DraftKings is investing more in sales and marketing, it seems like it is more costly for them to acquire new customers. However, please keep in mind that uh, DraftKings is investing heavily and so each time a state opens, they are forced to invest in marketing and advertising in order to uh, have brand awareness and to gain some market share in the new market. But I would still like the customer acquisition cost to get a little bit lower in the subsequent periods and uh, on top of that, I'm gonna go now and talk about the uh, payback period. This is another metric that shows how well the com this company invests and it, is, it showcases the period necessary for a customer to produce enough gross profit to pay back for its uh, customer acquisition cost. But as you can see here, the formula is for uh, 
sales and marketing expense in previous period divided by revenue per customer multiplied with gross profit. The payment period increased in the second half of 2021 more precisely in the third quarter and in the fourth quarter. Uh, the biggest expense, the biggest increase was in third th third quarter with, where there will be needed 19 years for a customer to be active on the platform to pay for it. If we're gonna look at the whole 2021, the payback period is around eight years and this came as a consequence of two things. First of all, the high spending and second of all, a pretty low gross margin for the company, only 39% in the year 2021. Next up, we're gonna be looking at the revenue retention. As you can see in this photo, the revenue retention rate for drafting seems to be good and it seems to be improving with time. As more time passes, the better revenue retention for the company is. We have the customer retention. As you can see in this photo, the company revealed a 96% customer retention for the states where it activated for at least 12 quarters. And it seems that the customers that are remaining on the platform, they're actually very, very happy with the platform. If we're gonna draw a conclusion from this, is it is that DraftKings uh, is improving its customer retention and the revenue per user as the company spends more time in the state. DraftKings doesn't disclose its activity per state, but for the first state launch, which is New Jersey, DraftKings is already contribution positive and the margin grew nicely with around 28% margin at the end of 2021. A quote from DraftKings CEO says that we had five states that had positive contribution in financial year 2021 and we anticipate five more states will have contribution profit in financial year 2022. So this is a good sign for the company. More than half of the states are expected to become contribution positive at the end of 2022. See in how many states DraftKings will be able to become contribution positive. This shows that for now DraftKings has some uh, strong unit economics, but the company is forced to keep reinvesting. And so far for all the unit economics that we've talked about, it seems like DraftKings will continue to burn through cash at a high rate. If you're going to exclude the two states where DraftKings has monopoly, the company becomes profitable faster as it can attain a bigger market share. So with this information, we can actually paint a good flywheel for the company. The first thing is better product, which in terms will lead to higher customer retention, which leads to biggest market share, and it finally leads to faster profitability. So we're going to start with the product and it's going to lead to a faster profitability. Next, I'm going to be looking at the management team. DraftKings is a founder-led uh, company with its CEO and uh, two of his friends uh, founding the company in 2012. In terms of ownership, the management owns around 3% of the company. Since it became public, DraftKings uh, delivered on its revenue guidance almost every time, with only one exception, uh, the third quarter of 2021, when they missed the revenue guidance. However, on the earnings side, the company missed its earnings estimates uh, on several occasions, as you can see in this photo. Going back on the ownership for just a second, the management owns 3% of the company and the CEO owns around 1.1% of the company. This is a small percentage for a company of uh, drastic size. I usually prefer companies with much more uh, insider ownership. So in this case, uh, for me, management is not a plus. Next up, we have the industry fundamentals. Now I'm going to be talking about three important aspects for every industry, and I'm going to start with the barriers to entry. So for uh, the online sports betting and for the iGaming, the barriers to entry are high. In order to attain new customers, a high amount of sales and marketing spend is necessary. Still, there are many mature operators in markets like Europe that have a, already a blueprint for how to spend money efficiently to attain new customers and so they will be able and they will be willing to invest in this uh, fast growing market in order to capture some market share next up i'm going to have the switching costs unfortunately for this industry in my opinion there are no switching costs so uh, especially with the policies that uh, the operators are now offering they are more and more appealing and so it is very easily for a customer to switch uh, operators lastly we have the pricing power i think it unfortunately did does not apply in here. And this is another difficult task for uh, an operator to retain customers without having uh, basically any, any pricing power. And uh, it represents another downside yet for the industry. Considering these two downsides for the industry, I think it only makes the drafting customer retention look better because it, it is truly very difficult to maintain the customer satisfaction and to maintain the customer for a longer periods of time and DraftKings has uh, succeeded in this so far. Now I'm going to be talking about what I believe to be a silent killer for DraftKings margin and one of the biggest threats for the company. And that is taxation. 
the taxation structure looks like this first of all we have the federal tax and second of all we have the state tax this is the most important one this is different for every state i have here a summary for the taxes that the operators must pay these are all applied on gross game revenue and the bigger tax amount for trucking is 51 percent as you can see in new york pennsylvania and tennessee the state taxes are actually pretty high starting with this the gross margin in new york can only be 49 percent tops and so that's very difficult and uh, it is a very big threat for the company. Before 2018, all of DraftKings revenue came from DFS. This has a margin of around 80%. Now, as you can see in this photo, the company expects for taxes to have a 27% impact in conjunction with an 8% impact by processing fees. Now, that's a 35% impact on DraftKings margin. This is very important because this is basically a cost that DraftKings needs to pay in order to run its business. So there's no way that they can avoid these taxes and these processing fees. From the get-go, DraftKings can only have a gross margin of 70% without even considering any other cost. And so their real gross margin expectation is around 55%, which is for me not terrible, but it's also not great. We've been accustomed to sorts of companies that can have between 75% and 80% gross margins. Uh, some of them maybe even higher than 80%. For a company to have a topped gross margin to 50%, uh, 6% at, I would say this is a, a huge downside for the company. Next I'm going to be focusing on competition. In terms of competition at the end of 2021 as you can see in this photo DraftKings had 32% of all online sports betting and 25% of all the GGR. Moreover DraftKings is one of the top three operators in the US. As you can see in this photo this seems to be a market very concentrated around these leaders. Most of the gross gaming revenue is concentrated around the top three players to be more precise actually there's two players race between DraftKings and FanDuel which is owned by the European giant Flutter Entertainment a study by Bank of America showed that New Jersey Pennsylvania and Michigan are the leaders in terms of online sports betting gross gaming revenue and in, in these three states FanDuel and DraftKings are the leaders so FanDuel has 40% followed by DraftKings with 30%. Additionally, there are many more operators that have deep pockets. We have operators like BetMGM, Barstool, or even Caesar, uh, William Hill, that are gonna want to gain some market share and also invest heavily. And so I expect this to be a uh, competitive market. Next time I'm gonna highlight some of the risks involved with investing in this type of uh, business. First of all, this is a hyper growth company. It looks to grow its revenue and invest heavily without a measurable ROI. Second of all, we have no earnings or cash flow. So the next up, the legislative environment might become harsher for the company. Before we jump into the financials, I'm going to showcase seven things to keep an eye for in order to see if the business is solid. The monthly unique players to surpass 2 million in the first half of 2021, preferably in the first quarter. The average revenue uh, per user to grow Next is the DraftKings result for New York. Uh, New York launched in the first quarter of 2022 and I want to see how much market share can uh, DraftKings attain in New York. Uh, and lastly, uh, the company guided the five states to become contribution profitable during this year and I want to see how many of those will actually be profitable. On the red flags, stock-based contribution. I would like to see that decrease in the subsequent periods. Second of all, we have the cross margin. I want to see that improving even slightly. I need to see that improving. And lastly, we have the customer acquisition payback period. I also want to see that decrease and get closer to three years. Next up, we have the financial overview. On the balance sheet, the company has uh, plenty of cash. So it has around 53% of its total assets in cash. In terms of uh, liabilities, the company has acquired some debt. It had acquired a 1.2 billion convertible note uh, it is convertible at the price of $95, so we are most likely that convertible note would remain as debt. Next up we have the stock-based compensation. As you can see in this photo, the stock-based compensation for 2021 grew significantly, uh, grew with more than 100% and now represents more than 70% of the uh, total assets and I think that's a pretty high percentage. I would like to see that below 10%. In terms of revenue, as you can see in this photo, the company managed to grow its revenue significantly uh, within uh, both 2020 and 2021. A 90% revenue growth in 2020, followed by a 100% growth in 2021. This is a phenomenal result for the company, but unfortunately, the gross margin crumbled. Again, 
payment processing fees, product passes were the main causes. As a reminder, this is the third red flag that I want to see improving for the company a better gross margin in the future. Moreover, the operating margin has also seen a significant decrease. As you can see in this photo, the operating margins grew with around 86% in the year 2021 and it represented around 160% of the revenue. So why are the margins so bad for DraftKings? A quote from, from DraftKings CEO, if we had not launched any additional states after year-end 2021, we expect that DraftKings would have been able to achieve a bit of profitability in the last quarter of 2022. This is for earnings before interest depreciation and amortization. The most important thing for the company is investing now, gaining market share and it will continue to do so and i know what you might be thinking uh, but when is going to be uh, the company turning a bit of positive or uh, how about earnings or how about free cash flow well unfortunately not anytime soon as a conclusion for now any investor must, must realize that DraftKings is a very risky business it needs to burn cash and there's absolutely no uh, proof that the company will be able to sustain this rhythm next up we're going to be looking at valuation and technicals we're going to start with the valuation and uh, honestly, no one knows how to value DraftKings. We estimate a 500 million EBITDA in 2026. Now, if we apply a totally random 20 times EBITDA multiple and we discount this to today using a 10% cost of capital, we would get a $80 for target price. That's it, that's our target price, $80. Now, the only thing that I have to argue against this uh, type of valuation is that it is based on forecasting. And it can be actually modified with one bet per quarter or one bet per quarter. So it's all in the wind. It's too easy for Gazi. It's a wazi. It's a woozy. I've done a scatterplot with companies from the betting industry. As you can see in this photo, I've included both operators and vendors. And uh, DraftKings has one of the biggest compounded annual growth rates in terms of revenue between 2021 and 2023. And it is valued around eight times enterprise value divided by 2022 gross profit. I think this is indicative of a fast-growing company, but unfortunately for DraftKings, the market recently has been very fond of companies that uh, have positive earnings, they have free cash flow, and uh, since this doesn't apply to DraftKings, the company has uh, really fallen out of uh, investors' grace. Next up on technical analysis, the trend for DraftKings, unfortunately, is definitely bearish, as you can see in this photo. And the stock price declined more than 70% from its all-time highs, and it sees now around 19 dollars the stock seems to have found a short-term resistance around 24 dollars and it sits well below its 100 simple moving average the blue line i think the drafting stock needs some consolidation consolidation period as you can see in this photo it seems to be consolidating between the 24 and the 15 price 24 level accuracy resistance on several occasions and i think we need to see some more consolidation now if the 15 dollar support breaks i think the stock might hit the 11 dollars price which was a good support in march 2020. for now if i would be you honestly i would not buy the stock there's nothing on the chart that screams bullish to me and i would expect it to consolidate some more have a nice uh, rectangle pattern and then have a breakout on one side or the other and especially with good volume if we want to have some exposure to the company you might open a very small position let's say 10 to 15 percent of the desired position you can open now in case you gonna get some FOMO later when the market is going to bounce to conclude i think that DraftKings has a lot of potential the company has many tailwinds it is activity in a very fast growing total addressable market and uh, i do believe that it will remain a market than the us but the company is now in a hyper growth mode which translates into a high degree of risk as we've seen recently the market puts a lot of emphasis of er on earnings, free cash flow, and DraftKings is just not there yet. The stock carries a high degree of risk, and it, me personally, I would not buy it just yet. All right, that was it from me. If you feel like you've learned anything over here today, or you wanna see some more in the stock reviews, please consider subscribing. Until next time, keep crushing it.